so Dave basically stole my thunder and uh, did a nice intro of Aileen. But yes, yeah, so above all the, you know, founder of a, a, a seed fund here in Silicon Valley, had a very illustrious career before at KP, but most importantly coined the term unicorn. You probably can't ever get away from that now. But okay, <laughs> how many of you are sick of the term unicorn? All right, that's not we, bad, actually. Uh, we love it. So that's I don't know bad. if you see our T-shirt. We have a swag uh, stand out there. We basically took it and ran with it. So we came up with our own terms, like centaurs and ponies. And um, so your royalties will be coming oh, I'm in looking the mail. Forward to those. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. So, um, so cowboy. So it's been about four years. Um, tell us how the last four years have been. Um, you made a big transition from, you know, being at KP, a large fund, and now you're running your own. Uh, I would say a seed stage, pre-Series A. Um, any big learnings yeah. from the last four years? So it's been an awesome, um, it's been an awesome four years. I feel really lucky. I'm kind of an accidental entrepreneur, to be <laughs> honest. I, um, you know, I had a, I had a great 13 years at Kleiner, um, and I was very fortunate to work with some really smart people who are, I think, best in class. And um, but as you know, the venture business has changed a lot. The startup business has changed a lot, and um, seed is this new category, institutional category, that kind of didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago. I wish I had started earlier, actually. Um, and I like so much about seed, right? The valuations are lower, the capital requirements are lower, the pace is different. We make, you know, on an average year, we would, the past year is not an average year for us, but an average year we might make 10 investments versus a GP at a traditional fund making maybe two investments. Um, seed is also much more collaborative, so I see folks in the room that we we co we co-invest with, which is what Series A and Venture used to be like. When I started at Kleiner, you know, Kleiner and Benchmark or Kleiner and Sequoia would split rounds, um, but you know, Series A and B have become so competitive that even if you're friends with a lot of people at other firms, it's kind of more elbows out. People want as much ownership as possible, and I think Seed. It's the riskiest part of the kind of investment cycle, and so working with other smart people and teaming up to try and help entrepreneurs together is, I think, so much more fun. Right, and just for um, for folks in the room who maybe aren't as familiar with the, the investing thesis for Cowboys, uh -huh. so you're, you, you mentioned 10 deals a year is the usual pace. Mm -hmm. um, check sizes, are you leading rounds on boards? Yep, so we like to co-anchor or co-lead rounds. Um, our average check size is usually between 500K to a million dollars in the first investment. Um, we, when I started Cowboy in 2012, uh, my goal was to build a blue chip consumer focused fund and, um, you know, kind of to shrink down, I think, what some of the best in class venture funds do, but do it at seed. Um, and it turned out actually that my deal flow and the ways that we could be helpful at enterprise was actually more than I thought. So now we actually are almost 60 40 enterprise consumer. Um, and so we do enterprise security and SaaS and hardware as well as marketplaces and consumer and audience based businesses. So we're definitely generalists, we're very focused, I think, more on founder quality and market sizes than, like, than specific theses. Right. So there's been a lot of talk throughout uh, this morning and the last few months. People are probably already sick of this, too. Um, if you had to pick between one of two uh, Shakespeare play titles to describe your sentiment about the market, <laughs> would it be The Tempest or Much Ado About Nothing? <laughs> Oh, my gosh. You know, I, boy, I have such a, I mean, I would say we are, uh, technology and the train of technology is unstoppable, right? And so we are in a valuation adjustment, a much needed valuation adjustment um, period, I think, where valuations were too high and rounds were too big. Um, and company, the financial plans of companies were unneeded, I think, un unnecessarily aggressive. Um, like too many companies, I think, were building kind of shoot the moon strategies, and you uh, don't uh, build a great company a lot of times by going like for a shoot the moon. And as Mike talked about, and other, and Selena and John talked about, like building culture, building substance, building your bench, all those things take time. Building customer love, customer understanding, those things take time. Um, but I think, <coughs> in terms of like where we are in terms of unicorn trends, like I think there will be more unicorns in five years than there are now in terms of technology. Um, yeah. You know, you obviously the, the list has been called, I think, from a year ago because there were too many overvalued companies. But I think just there are so many industries that are still wide open and relatively untouched by technology and good software. So I think that that is uh, that that trend is not going to change. Yeah, and I guess for you personally, um, I mean, there's a lot of kind of indicators of whether there is um, you know market correction or it's just stabilizing after a period of very tremendous growth. But for you, I guess day to day. What's your biggest indicator of 
the fact that the market is changing or yeah. stabilizing? Is it the macro trends that you see happening out, you know, that really VC doesn't have much control over? Or would you say it's, you know, even what you hear yeah. from colleagues or even your, your founders, like your own portfolio? Yeah, I think the adjustment is definitely more micro rather than macro. Like we're not seeing, like we saw in 2008, customers saying like, sorry, I, I'm not gonna use new technology, right? Like that's not happening. In 2008, like budgets dried up for experimentation. We're not seeing that from the client side. Um, I definitely think it's more that, you know, a year ago we would meet a startup that had not yet written a line of code and they would have multiple term sheets after a first meeting raising like four at 10 pre, right? So 14 posts for a seed stage company, I think is just, it's too, it's not right. Unless the founders, unless, you know, unless something's been proven or the founders have this incredible prior track record, but it puts startups and investors in a bad place to be at like a 14 or $15 million post money valuation before an A. Right, because then the A kind of by definition has to be a 20 pre. And so you just kind of get, you set the cycle in a very bad trend. And so I think the place that we should be now is um, seed rounds should be smaller and at lower valuations because the A investors are sitting with pretty large portfolios of expensive investments they've made over the past few years, which has made them much more cautious to make new investments. So their bars are higher. It's harder to raise uh, follow on rounds now. I think B is even harder than A. And so that's why we've slowed our pace considerably, and I'm guessing a lot of the investors in the room have as well, just because it's, it's a much tougher fundraising environment, and we expect it'll be that way for the next couple of years. Right, so um, I mean, you're usually, your entry point's usually seed, like pre-series A, mm -hmm. and I assume if the company goes on to raise an A, you may or may not follow on, or, or do you ever lead co or code lead right. those rounds, and then is there a point where you, you stop, or? So our, our second fund that we're currently investing is 60 million. So we don't have a big enough fund to be able to lead A's or B's. We always follow on generally through A and B. We've even followed on a couple of our portfolio companies are C and D. And if we still think that there's upside, we will continue to invest. But our entrepreneurs know like with our fund size, we're kind of limited in how long we can go. Right, and so um, with the second fund, do you see a big difference or change in terms of what you invest in or how you're investing compared to fund one? You know, fun too, we're so early, like we're going okay. so slow. I'd say like, it kind of stresses me out <laughs> how slowly <laughs> we're going right now. But um, I would say uh, the thing that we're really excited about is something that one of our entrepreneurs, Karen Snyder from Textio has defined as, you know how like there's a lot of jokes right now about like, oh, sprinkle AI on it and it will be better. <laughs> um, <laughs> like I think like, you know, AI just sounds like really vague and confusing, but I think or the machine way learning she, or she <laughs> yeah, she, the way she terms it is learning loops which is most of the software that we use today is not very smart software, right? It's kind of command response where you give it a, a direction and it is kind of hard coded to do something in response. Um, it's not learning software. And I think the reason, like we're kind of in this funky lull in terms of tech trends after you know five or seven years of really exciting tech trends around mobile as the reason why and cloud as the reason why and security as the reason why. Um, but I think the next reason why will be smarter software and learning loop software, software that actually gets better and changes based on data and based on user behavior. Um, and so that's something that we have a couple investments in fund one and kind of what we call learning loop software. And I think that like pretty much every industry on the planet, 10 years from now, will have much more, much smarter software than they have today. Right, um, so slightly different question. So we're, I think we're gonna have a couple panels on this um, in either track one or track two after lunch, but just the general topic of liquidity or, or lack thereof. And yeah. you, you have a very unique perspective in that you've been in venture um, for a long enough time that you probably have seen this cycle, I right? I know, this so is all hair color. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, there's there's been people talking about there's gonna be more M&A, um, and there, there have been like Twilio's going public this week. Yeah, and, it's exciting. Um, and then there's, you know, definitely, it's in some ways a bit of a pain point for early investors and employees and founders in terms of like getting any kind of liquidity as companies stay private longer. But I guess like, what is what is your perspective, either what you're seeing in your own portfolio that you can't talk about, but but what's your perspective in terms of like what the next couple yeah. years are gonna look like? So um, I would say, you know, I've, my, uh, our founders kind of joke that they call me like Debbie Downer sometimes. Because <laughs> um, we've kind of been warning for the past year, like, look, it's, you know, winter is coming and we need to be prepared and it may be very long. Um, and from an M&A perspective, it's really exciting, the big M&A that's happened in the past uh, few months even, but it's big M&A, 
right? And small M&A, like the 50, like, you know, it used to be, I think, five years ago, founders thought like, oh, I can just get bought for 50 or $100 million and like, we'll, we'll all be happy as long as I don't raise too much. Well, obviously, people raise too much. And um, I don't think small M&A is happening nearly as much as it used to. I think it, it'll, it's safer in enterprise and in SaaS because you've got companies that have huge market caps and a lot of them who have like roadmap holes that they want to fill. But in consumer, if you think about like the M&A that happened five years ago or three years ago, a lot of it was private companies with very um, highly valued private stock, you know, whether it was Dropbox or Twitter before, like a bunch of private companies that were being square, being acquisitive. I don't think we see those companies being as acquisitive as they were five years ago. And then a lot of the big corporates like AT&T, American Express, AOL, Yahoo, um, I don't think we see them being as acquisitive either. And so I think in terms of consumer M&A, it's going to be much rougher going for smaller companies. Right. I know one of the comments, um, and this might have been Mark Andreessen in some interview, but um, that a lot of the acquirers are going to be, like you said, like not the traditional acquirers in tech, but maybe even like, I don't know. Lowe's or I mean yeah. more traditional but these are companies brands. that trade at like normal multiples you know so they're going to be much more sensitive to how no, kind of at what multiples they acquire so I think founders should be or will become much more sober I think about thinking about how to potentially optimize what we call local maxima mm -hmm. right which is like this may not be the outcome that you were dreaming about but sometimes like there's an old climber fr climber phrase like the time to take the hors d'oeuvres is when they're being passed around like, you know, if you if if you might be able to get an offer that's, you know, from someone whose stock is good or, or cash, like I, I I definitely think it's a more sober environment than it was a year ago. Right. So um I know there's um so one topic I know you're you're pretty passionate about is the fact that there seems to be a lack of kind of mentorship and apprenticeship yeah. in VC, which is what traditionally VC is known for. It's very much an apprenticeship model. And um, especially with a lot of, say, these seed stage companies who are able to, maybe not, I guess, recently, but able to throw rounds together, um, very founder friendly, lack of a board. They want to do what they want. Yeah. Um, but you feel like that's, um, it's definitely not a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing. So we, we did a quick analysis of, you know, I, there are some companies that seemingly shut down abruptly in the past year that you may have read about. And we kind of did a quick analysis of like, you know, how were they funded? Who was on the board? And a lot of these companies didn't have boards. A lot of these companies did party rounds at pretty high valuations where they didn't like build the accountability around them to basically set milestones to get feedback from lead investors on like, hey, winter's coming or hey, you know, we only have six months of cash left. Like we really should start thinking about what our plan is or nine months of cash left. Like if you don't put together a strong board, um, you don't get that kind of advice. And I think we had been living in an environment where some entrepreneurs were cautioning other entrepreneurs that like don't build a board or just do a party round and optimize for valuation. And um, I think that is coming home to roost. Um, but I also think that, you know, the venture industry and so many funds growing so quickly in the past five years, and also some of it is also like the the generational dynamics where younger people are really eager to sit on boards. Like sitting on a board is like a vanity metric. <laughs> like how many <laughs> boards are you on? And it shouldn't be. Like being a really good board member is hard and it takes time, it takes energy, and it takes years to learn. Like I'm still learning all the time. Um, and so I have seen, you know, we're seeds, so we don't often keep board seats after A. And so we see, you know, both in companies that we've worked with and outside companies, Boards where you just don't have a lot of experienced board members who have not seen winter, who have who haven't who like kind of hasn't haven't kind of lived through a lot of the movies of how things go wrong or how things go well, and so and and they're afraid to have honest conversations with founders, yeah. um, and so I'm I'm hoping that venture firms will use this time to actually reconsider how they are developing talent internally and to mentor their younger partners and teach them how to be great board members. Right, and for your team, um, so your investment team is how many right now? It's two of us. Oh, there's only two of you guys. Okay. Um, We're small. Well, so how do you think about that even for your own team or even yeah. future partners or, you know? Um, it's definitely something we think about, you know, it's, it's um, you know, because we're seed, we don't want to make our funds too big because um, we want to make sure we can deliver great returns to our LPs. And so by definition, we just can't build very, a very large team. So we're focused on quality rather than quantity. Right, right. Um, and I guess like, what would you, what would you be your words of wisdom to the audience who are VCs who do invest in the syndicate rounds without a lead? Are you kind of like, you're screwed? I'm or? sure nobody <laughs> here does that. You'll be fine. <laughs> Nobody does that anymore, right? 
Um, okay, great. Um, and then I guess, you know, Anand earlier talked about um, commerce um, specifically, mm -hmm. um, but I know commerce is something that Cowboy invests in. You yeah. have invested in the past. Yep. Are you still bullish on it? Are you kind of cautious? Yeah, or I mean, how do you our feel? first investment was Dollar Shave Club. Um, so, you know, we ha are fortunate to have be having some great experiences with commerce companies. Commerce is really tricky. It's really hard. Like in the unicorn analysis that we've done, it tends to be one of the more cash consumptive businesses um, and the multiples and the outcomes are not as great. Um, so you have to be really careful. I think we mm -hmm. have a lot of scar tissue for better, for worse in right. commerce. So we are quite conservative about it. But um, I think a lot of it in commerce is obviously not as much technology risk. It's really go to market risk and marketing mm -hmm. risk. And like when we met Michael Dubin from Dollar Shave Club, it was like, this guy is a magical marketer. You know, and like that's, you have to make sure that the, the traits and the strengths of the founder line up with where the key risks are in the business. Right, I would say that we're, despite a lot of VCs becoming allergic to commerce, we're still yeah. actually pretty bullish on it. I think still careful, right? But yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, and I guess, um, so I guess we have the one minute mark, but um, the last question I'll ask you is, um, so I guess like for Cowboy, what, what are you guys doing in terms of uh, like how you think about um, investing in diverse founders or businesses, mm -hmm. um, I guess both in terms of where you're actually putting money, but also just in the industry, especially for this audience for yeah. BC. Um, and I know um, Mary and Derek touched on this too. It's really funny, like having a, being a female founder now and our, uh, my team members, Joanne and Michelle are both female, so we're a hundred percent female uh, firm, oh but nice. we're very open-minded to hiring a guy. <laughs> um, and, but well I can totally it. see how this happens. Like when we said, we told people that we were looking to hire and like basically all I got was female candidates. And so I would say like the guys with all due respect to my many male friends who I respect a lot, like it's totally bullshit if you say that there's no women that you can hire because all I get is women. <laughs> um, but I have to make an effort to hire a guy. And so we're gonna do that. <laughs> we're gonna make an effort to hire a guy. <laughs> they're, they're out there. Yes, I, I, I know, I've heard that they yeah. are. Yeah, actually, I was reflecting, looking even around this room. Um, I think when you think of a VC conference, you think of um, a certain type of can, uh, you know, you certain type of person. But you I all at Five Hundred <laughs> do such an amazing job of building this incredibly capable, diverse village. Oh, thank Super you awesome. so much. Appreciate it. I guess, like for your portfolio, um, do you have an, do you have a sense of what's sort of the breakdown in terms of uh, either uh, women, gender, race? Yeah, we or have. I, uh, we have about 30, about a third of our founders That's are um, impressive, yeah. female. Yeah. That's great. I haven't done the tally of how many are effeminate males, but I'll get that <laughs> for you. <laughs> uh, I don't think Derek is going to live that down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Aileen. This was great. Thank you thank for you having everyone. me. Thank you, everybody.